On my right here is another John. This time, John Abernethy. The first person, John, I'd like to say that's actually been able to make it from Visit Scotland. So uh, thanks very much for uh, coming to take part. Um, that's three years I've been trying to get someone from Visit Scotland to come and uh, contribute. So um, it's much appreciated. John, uh, not has not only spent the last seven years or past seven years working at the Tourist Information Office on uh, Princess Street and dealing with all manner of inquiries, he's also an author and uh, co-wrote Barbara Dixon's autobiography. Caroline um, Sewell on my left is from the Musicians' Union, which is the oldest supporter of uh, Born to be Wide and um, previously worked at No Half Measures, which is a, a large management company here in Scotland. And Rose Norton will be a familiar face to some of you. She, she crops up on a, a wide variety of uh, different panels, the most recent one being our music retail panel. And Rose um, co-owns Coda Music on the Mound. So um, all of them have different things to uh, bring to this conversation. And John and I were, uh, John Langford and I were already touching on this before the interval. And I guess it's an opportune uh, time to carry on where we left off, John. So you've, um, you start talk to talk about um, how it's important with music tourism to, to take into consideration the, the smaller venues and, the, and also the smaller music businesses that act as a feeder to the scene. So are there, any, um, are there any examples that you've seen in other places or any initiatives that you see are, are about to happen in Glasgow on that front to really assist um, and bring it all together? Yeah, I, th I think you really just need a joined up approach. Um, and the one thing that I'm finding encouraging, at least about Glasgow at the moment, is that the city is thinking about music and the city is thinking about tourism. Um, and they're thinking about it, obviously, as I said earlier, on the success of the hydro, but at least they're having conversation about it. Um, and they're looking at other cities around the world as uh, comparisons. You know, they're looking at Nashville. Um, I mentioned earlier they're looking at Berlin. They're looking at Liverpool. Um, and so they're, they're at least they're thinking about it. And you can't just look at one sector of the music industry. You need to look at all the venues. You need to look at all the forms of music. You need to look at all the ways that music is consumed. And at least, it, as I say, the city's talking about it. And are there any things that are about to happen? I mean, obviously, Glasgow got the won the bid for the UNESCO City of Music status in, in record time. I mean, I think it even took the city by the surprise how quickly that was approved but do you see any things that um are fairly easy um to do and that are about to be done i mean that you would you would recommend uh, well the first thing that we're doing is we've got a meeting about it next week i think they've got seven strands of um business development that they're talking about in glasgow so scientific development is one and um bringing tourists through the airport is is another and then we're talking about music tourism so you know, I, I can't tell you what they're going to do at the moment, but at least we're talking, and we're talking right across the industry. Uh, we're talking right through from the owners of the, the small clubs and pubs to th those people that manage bands to those of us, you know, the Hydro and the SECC. I mean, Rose, um, I think one thing that people don't necessarily think about when they think about music tourism is record shops. But one of the reasons that... I wanted you to take part in this discussion is that you are just off the Royal Mile on the mound and you probably have more exposure to, to tourists and visitors here in Edinburgh than, than any other music business. Um, how many, um, what percentage, or how many of your customers are from abroad? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we did a, our own survey um, back last summer and throughout the summer months, we found that 70% of our customers were tourists. And I think the fact that we are still surviving as a record shop in the difficult times that the record shops are having now is because the tourist industry in Edinburgh. Um, I'm not sure what the tourist industry would be like for a record shop 
sounding traditional music in Glasgow, but I know that because people come to Edinburgh, they're looking for traditional folk music, which is what we specialise in on CDs. And that is so important to our business. We couldn't have survived without the tourist industry. I know the... Kevin, um, who owned the Avalanche record shops, um, talked a lot about uh, people coming into his shops. And I think um, it partly contributed to the vast numbers of Merceau and Eagle Owl CDs that um, were sold. I imagine there's people listening to those all around the world. I mean, is this something that you pick up that there are people now that come to Edinburgh and are going to all of the record shops. I mean, have you had any evidence of that where people come come to the city and appreciate the fact that there are still quite a lot of uh, record shops here um, that they'll go yeah. record shopping in general? Yeah, yeah they do. Um, we opened a vinyl section um, two and a half years ago and we didn't expect it to be as popular with tourists as it has been, partly because of people actually just trying to put vinyl into their suitcases, <laughs> something as simple as that. But we're actually surprised at how many vinyls are selling to tourists. Um, the CD shop, the CD part of the shop, is specialist in folk and traditional music. And that's the majority of people that come into our shop looking for typical Celtic music. Now, we obviously try to send the customer away with something that they're going to play for years to come. Um, we feel as though at the um, coalface of the customers coming into the shop that we do play an important role in promoting Scottish acts. And um, I was just thinking about this in the interval, that the majority of Scottish acts that we sell and we promote to the customers are actually self-releasing artists. So that is actually going right back down to the grassroots level. And local acts, local acts that are self-releasing, that's the majority of CDs that we're selling to tourists. So do you have any, do you get any feedback on this? Do you have people from abroad going, I've, I played this album to all my friends and yes. they love it yes. too. Can you yes. send us some more yes. or do they, are they coming to play in my country? Uh, yeah, we get that. But, and we also get the same tourists back maybe the following year or two years later asking if that act has another CD out. Right, and do you get people ordering music from you as yeah, well? Yeah, we get you know, off the, the website. Shop? We get emails from people for recommendations as well. Yeah. So, I mean, that seems to me, you know, just with one one shop alone, quite mm. a a striking thing. I mean, it's it's not just a, it's not just a matter of someone popping in and um, like they would maybe in the Hard Rock Cafe and buying themselves a T-shirt. I mean, they're they're coming back every time mm -hmm. and. Um, they're also spreading the word about Scottish talent mm -hmm. uh, abroad. Yeah. Um, John, do you find people come into the the office and um, looking for record shops? Do you do you get any requests from people that are, are wanting to buy music? Um, not not really. But what we do get is very much that they want to experience a Scottish music event. A Scottish music evening. They want to hear Scottish music in some shape or form. The, 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 the problem then, not the problem, but the interesting thing is then it's time to define what that is. But we find that the people that come in, the most very similar, similar to those, the busiest time is the summer. And the question is, where do we get to two tickets? That's, that's question number one. But throughout the year, the question that we get asked is, where can we hear Scottish music? And when they come to the tourist office, it tends to be, it's not so much they want to, to purchase something. It is that they want to, um, they want to appreciate it. They want to experience a Scottish music event. And what kind of uh, things are you able to send them to? I mean, what kind of, um, what kind of information exists there from the, the music community here in Edinburgh to really put into the hands of visitors? Well, at the moment, 
we're still quite old fashioned. Most of what we do is that we give out brochures, paper copies, that sort of thing. So at the moment when all we really have at the moment is things like the gig guide, uh, the skinny magazine, we don't, there's a few, uh, there's a few Kaylee, uh, uh, they have sort of leaflets that we can hand out. But at the moment, that's all we really have. We don't have an awful lot of written material, quite old fashioned, but we don't have a lot of written material to give to, to, to visitors. And is there anything um, which stops you, hand, you know, if someone, are there any th reasons that you would say to people, no, we can't stock a, a flyer or promotional material for your venue or for your gig? Or No. So it's totally open to anyone in the music community that wants to, to promote something? Yes. Okay. And, I mean, is this, uh, you say that, by and large, it's it's traditional things that people are looking for, or live music. What what we find is that there's a lot of people who come for specific things. They want to um, they want to go to a, a jazz bar. They want to go to a jazz club. They want to do um, a specific thing. They want to hear a specific sort of music. But the but the majority, I would say come and they, they don't really know what they want to hear. They just, they know they want to hear Scottish music or Celtic music. And to them, that could be, you know, some, it, it can veer from the proclaimers to the soundtrack from Brave. It doesn't, they just have this idea that they want to hear Scottish music. Um, defining what that is is very difficult, but it also means it's a great opportunity because they're very open to, to whatever, you know, good music is out there. And I think that's, there's a, there's a gap. It's an untapped market that, that at the moment we're not really tapping. It's bad English. Yeah. Are there any, rather, um, any requests that are particularly unusual? I mean, do you get people coming in and asking where there's a, a metal night or some kind of minimal techno evening? Uh, well, no, but... Um, <laughs> But my favourite, my favourite one, and I'm glad I got it, was that someone, I was working at the airport and someone wanted to get to Kerry Muir. And so I looked up how the best way to get to Kerry Muir and then I got into conversation and asked him why he was going to Kerry Muir. And he said he wanted to go and see where Bon Scott was born. So I was... the first Yeah, late, so and unbelievably, they kind of poo-pooed the idea of having exactly. um, some kind of bon scott festival did you know that bon scott was born in kiri muir no that's somewhere is there a blue plaque or something on a family excursion yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it was quite i'm gonna good. go to the airport and get directions yeah i think it was quite good that i, I got this person because i think other, everyone else would have been but yeah that was probably the most unusual i've had and what kind of things do you think the music community could be doing i mean obviously we're taught we're in edinburgh at the moment but you know, is there some advice that you would would give in general for how to engage with uh, with tourists? At, at the moment, it's still quite you know basic level. It's that we we visit Scotland is there to promote what's going on in Edinburgh and Scotland. Uh, we can't and basically we we can't be seen to favour anyone over someone else. So basically, what we do is that we give as much material information as possible. So if we have more material and information to give to them so they can make up their own minds, that's all to the good. Okay, I mean, I think this is, uh, listen listen to this, musicians. The There isn't any information there other than the gig guide. So either get yourself in the gig guide or start hanging out um, at the top of Waverley Market. Mm -hmm. It's not called Waverley Market anymore, is no, it? No, it's, it's called Princess Mall. It's Princess quite, Mall, it's quite yeah, sad. I'm showing my age. Um, so, Caroline, you've, um, you're have you here in your capacity as the music, uh, Musicians Union Regional Officer, to give you your full title. But um, Obviously, you're representing the interests of musicians, but you've you've also published a guide for businesses and pubs that want to incorporate a, a music element, and really that's explaining best practice to them and how to how to effectively do that. I mean, what would your what are your tips to businesses that are are thinking about having music on? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it's called it's called a live music kit, and really, what it's all about is information to venues, live music venues, or would be live music venues, 
I mean, in Scotland, you can be a live music venue if you have an alcohol license, you have, you know, music in your kind of operations plan and a capacity of 100 or more or something. It might not even be that, but, you know, it, it's dead, dead easy. There's an economic benefit to it as well. We all know these days pubs are struggling. Um, and PRS did a study, and I think it was something like on the nights that they had live music, they took, you know, 25% more than they would have done on any other night. So there's a real economic benefit to be had by the pubs as well as providing a really lovely experience for people who just so happen to be walking past. So this is really just all about letting them know that, how to go about booking a band, you know, if you don't know, if you're just a public and, you know, running a pub day to day, how do you go about booking a band? Maybe you don't have time, or maybe you should bring in, you know, an independent promoter or someone that can do that for you, split the cost. There's, you know, there's there's ways of going about it that will benefit your business in, in lots of different ways. So it's about doing that. And what John was saying about, you know, he, you know, visit Scotland, need the information from, um, you know, the bands and, and the music scene in general. But at the same time, if they're, you know, if the music is just out there, there's something nice about just stumbling across somewhere with music already playing that hasn't just been contrived for the tourists almost as well. I know certainly when I go abroad and, um, you know, I spend quite a lot of time in Ireland with my job and things as well, it's just nice to walk in somewhere and there's live music playing. So I think it's about empowering and supporting the venues as much as it is about empowering the musicians as well. And specifically in the case of Edinburgh, what do you think the city could do to actually help uh, develop that scene and to to deliver those opportunities outside the the festival time and outside that little window we have around Christmas and Hogmanay? Well, Edinburgh City Council have recognised at least that there is an issue within the city. Um, the zero audibility rule, which I don't know if everybody knows about this, that exists in Edinburgh, whereby if you're a resident near a music venue, you're not meant to hear any of the amplified music, and it's it's it's, it's completely unreasonable. So you know they are they are looking at it, but I actually think that the issue kind of lies, I think, more within within the council themselves and within the, you know, the politics at a much local level. Music tourism has been discussed at parliamentary levels, but it seems to be when it gets to local council levels that it, they, they let us down, you know, um, with policies like zero audibility. Um, and actually when you get to the crux of it, when you get to the bare bones of it, within the council, there's not really anybody that knows about live music. There's not really anybody who's who's telling the live music venues what to do and when to turn down and when to turn off your music and how loud, you, how loud you're allowed to be. There's actually not really anybody within the council who, who kind of knows anything about PA systems or sound design or anything like that. So I think that's where we probably have to start addressing the problem. Because to have a fully functioning live music scene you need to be allowed to have grassroots level venues medium-sized venues up to big venues and not even just for the musicians for the promoters for the sound engineers for the lighting engineers um you know it's a, it's a kind of it, it, it's a progress and it's kind of upward and outward mobility um and so there's lots that they can do so you obviously part of your job is also northern ireland and Presumably, uh, people don't go postal in Belfast because someone's um, someone's playing a bit of amplified music. I mean, um, why is it the um, why is it the other cities seem to be able to have a, a social balance and um, manage to get that balance right? And it is such an issue in Edinburgh. Do you think it's a really interesting one? I spent a lot of time in Belfast. I've been with the MU since you know last summer. I've been over there a lot. Been making a, a point to spend a lot of time over there, and with Northern Ireland. And I hope this isn't a massive generalisation, but I think that for a long, long time they've had other politics to deal with, and they've had bigger fish to fry essentially. Which is why, from for us at the MU, it's not quite as easy for us to go over there and lobby at Stormont as it is for us to, you know, go to hold, you know, round the corner where the, the doors are open and they'll take on board what we're saying as a trade union. Um, so I think that's maybe the Belfast case. With Edinburgh, I, I'm not sure. I come from Glasgow, and Glasgow certainly had its issues, but it's 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 not as much of an issue. But it is a it's a culture thing, you know, the the, the HMV Picture House thing. 
they it didn't it doesn't seem like they consider for a second the cultural impact of removing a venue of that size from the city. Um, they don't seem to consider the impact on on the music scene, and I think that it's, it's an education thing, um, and I think it will be a long haul. There is a problem here in this city, and um, it does seem slightly ludicrous to be talking about building a mid-sized venue. Um, uh, council taxpayers' expense when one already exists. Uh, maybe something, I think what Caroline was saying, some more creative thinking is required. And I think that goes back to what, um, that's what you were saying is, um, as well, John. I mean, I think that it's easy to look at Glasgow and say, um, all right, everything's a bed of roses there. But, you know, in the early days of King Tut's, there was someone from the the licensing police, as um, it was referred to, that was really determined to um, to close the venue down. And that seems almost inconceivable um, nowadays, where it's, you know, frequently winning awards for the best small venue and it is very much a part of the um, part of the Glasgow cultural landscape. Why do you, um, what do you think's happened in Glasgow that's, um, that's different to Edinburgh in that respect from what you've been able to ascertain since you moved over here? I don't think we should be giving the responsibility and accountability to other people. I think we need to be responsible ourselves for making a change. Um, and I mean, you pick any city in the world and you're gonna, we're going to be able to find somebody who tried to close down a venue or somebody who's got a noise complaint or something. But I think we need to use our power through the democracies that exist to make the change. Um, and if you take the King Tut's example, King Tut's is there today because somebody at the time was like, well, fuck you. We want, this is a venue. We need the venue. We've got the bands and, you know, we're going to do it. So yeah, I think that there was... Uh Labour councillor that um, actually went to the venue and they had a word in his ear and um, that seemed to have uh, changed things as a result. But I mean, I mean, there are good things happening in Glasgow, but I think a lot of that is because they've seen the success of music and the success of music didn't germinate because the city sat around a boardroom table and said, well, you know, let's drive a music direction. It's just they've seen successes and Granted, the, the Hydro has brought a tremendous amount of success. I mean, we're the second busiest venue in the world. And all of that publicity, the city's now patting themselves on the back and pretending that they're the reason for it. So, you know, we also have the bullshit in Glasgow too. But the bottom line is that they've seen the successes and now they're making it work. And I don't know what advice I could offer to Edinburgh except that it's the people in the room that are going to make the difference. It's not going to be somebody around a boardroom table. Yes, you need to target the people at the boardroom table and the, the union need, needs to do their work and events like this need to happen. But ultimately, somebody needs a guitar and a microphone. So looking at it the other way, obviously, um, big festivals um, very often attract people from far away. People will plan a trip around um, a major festival or a major music event. So um, how can the hospitality sector feed into the the number of people that you're bringing into into Scotland through the hydro, what kind of um, steps? They're can, feeding off the number of people we bring into the um, sector. But how uh, does it? I mean, what kind of things can be done? I mean, obviously, um, hotels is a is pretty obvious, and um, that can almost be a problem in itself at certain times, or because the hotel rates go up so high that it it becomes. Um, almost a, a barrier to people going to the city. But I mean, are there any, um, are there any visitor attractions that um, have approached you and that are trying to sell their attractions or their, their services to, to people coming to the hydro? Yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to what I said about the joined up approach is that we're just trying to get everybody around the table to talk about these things. Hotels are benefiting from us. We're benefiting from audiences, but at the same time, there's a negative impact from the Hydro, and it's probably not something you would expect me to say, but the success of the Hydro has certainly had a negative impact on parts of the nighttime economy in, in Glasgow. Um, you know, when, when we've got busy nights and we've got 15,000 people in the venue, you've got all the taxis and all the transport and everything coming to the Hydro and nobody going to Saki Hall Street, so the garage is not as busy as it 
probably would have been. So it, it, we need to develop a joined up approach and it's not easy to do. You know, and sometimes you need people to facilitate and mediate it because you know, we want to sell as many tickets as possible and that may be at the detriment of something else. A hotel wants to put their rates up and that's at the detriment of somebody who's probably going to spend that, that money somewhere else. So, I mean, are there, are there practical solutions to this? For example, having an after show in the garage or have you got to that point yet where you're speaking to the smaller venues about you know, spreading the love or having them... We're speaking about spreading things. the love, but nothing active has been done yet. And what about um, attractions themselves? I mean, is there is there a scope, for example, to to have a, you know the Riverside Museum advertising on the back of your tickets, or are there any kind of things like that that have um, that have been considered or that you've discussed with anyone? Yeah, they've been spoken about, but again, you know, somebody's got to drive it, um, and who's going to drive those things, and who's going to drive the joined up approach, and. That's probably for me the big difference between Edinburgh and Glasgow on this is Glasgow's talking about it at the very, very senior level and they recognize that it's a value driver for the local economy. They don't have a castle. They don't have the tourists coming in as you do here in Edinburgh. So they need to create tourism and they're creating tourism through various strands. And tell me, I mean, with you mentioned the castle and the tattoo does actually, you do get tattoo packages. So people come over on... God, I know my Edinburgh, parents came out. <laughs> spend a night here, have a um, engage my services as a tourist guide, and then in the evening go up to the tattoo, and they're off the next day. But the the high point of their trip is obviously my tour, and then the uh, then it all goes downhill with this sort of exercise in militarism. But um, nevertheless, I mean, this is um, this is something that is very much sold as a package. Is that something that's happening with the hydro already? Yeah, we're not driving it. It's been driven by other people outside of our business. So the hotels are driving it, the tour operators are driving it, the bus bus companies are driving it, the taxi operators are driving it, the the tour guides like yourself are driving it. And so the hydro has created its own economy um, in probably this, in the same way that the tattoos, you know, created its own economy. And um, do you have any operators that get, I mean, do you sell them a block of tickets then or does, no. do you leave that totally to the promoters? No, no, too? no, no, no. That's, tickets should be in the hands of fans. And it's, it's funny, we're just talking about music tourism, one of the, and you've read most of the music tourism research, but one of the key findings of that is that we need to get, we need to legitimize and put structures in place around secondary ticketing so that fans can be getting tickets um, as opposed to the big tour operators. I mean, it, the I don't mean as sort of to encourage touting. I mean it more that you know a friend of mine in Mexico works for an agency that if you want to go to Glastonbury, then they'll put the whole trip together for you. And there's you know there's a company in the north of England that organises coach packages to the Wacken Festival in in Germany. So you know those things. Um, those things exist already in, in other countries. And, you you know, much like you would buy a, a package to go to a musical in London or something like no, that. No, that's happening. I mean, we've got Iceland Air that we work quite closely with to bring in tourists from, from Iceland, obviously. Um, and they're masters at I mean, that's, you know, how the Airways yeah. Festival was created. So it's so interesting to see how that'll, that'll develop then on the Scottish front. I mean, John, you've... Um, you're obviously coming out from a, a tourism perspective, are there um, any things where you see there's room for, for joined up thinking or where, you know, maybe there's someone comes in and asks you about somewhere they can sell, they can see live music in Edinburgh, but, you know, can you see a day where you can then maybe suggest a festival to them somewhere else or something that will encourage them to extend their extend their stay. Well, yeah, very much so. Already. The joined up things are happening, or like with the two, also you get a lot of the musical, at the Playhouse, musical theatre, you're seeing more packages, people are coming on packages to go and see Wicked and stay a couple of nights, and that's, it's happening more and more. Um, we also, because we have, we promote all of Scotland, so we have like guides for, um, like there's a festivals guide 2015, for example, so, we, it, it mentions all 
you know, the guides, uh, the festivals that are taking place throughout from Shetland to, to Dumfries. So, yeah, it's very much our job is to, is to promote not just Edinburgh, but all of Scotland. And when people buy these packages for musicals, do you, is there any way that you can you press a flyer to, you know, offer them a discount to yeah. Hollywood or no, no, you know, no, any no, of no, those no. other things? They, these are people who bought these in advance. They, they, they bought right. the package. They don't buy the package when they come. They bought the hotel. They bought the... But uh, once they're here, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. When yeah. I've been to Iceland Airwaves, each time I go, I get more and more Icelandic stuff in my, my goodie yeah. bag. And if I want to go on a, a tour of, uh, of a glacier or into some lava caves or something like that, my my Airwaves delegate badge or my rather my Airwaves ticket will get me a discount on these tours. Is that something that's... That's uh, happening with some of these packages. Some of these packages, yeah, you you'll get if you go on the sightseeing bus, you get you'll see that these um, comp the sightseeing bus tours they'll give you uh, two pounds off something else or twenty percent off something else. So you'll get um, you might get some money off going to a certain restaurant. It, it does happen. It's it's not it's becoming more frequent. It's not prevalent. It's becoming more frequent. These kind of um, deals that people are tying in with other people. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, do you think again, it's it's what John's describing that it really requires someone to be to be speaking to all those different parties and and coordinating it all? No, but well, um, but yeah, but who's it's it's not yeah, it's not visit Scotland like a you know a government public body to do that. It's it has to come more companies. Actually, the companies have to talk more to other companies, and that it all adds additional value to everything. So like hotels should be speaking to bands to, to put on music nights. Um, bus companies should be speaking to uh, businesses to where they should maybe stop. You know, it, it should all be tying in that way, to be honest. And does anyone speak to you, Rose? I mean, do you, do you ever get someone coming in and going, well, all right, you know, I recognize that you you're in this prime location and you've got, millions of tourists coming in every day do you do you ever get folk coming in going like look if you your customers buy a cd then you know i'll give them 25 percent off a meal or maybe you can send them into my museum or my my gallery or my visitor attraction no <laughs> okay interesting i mean it, it seems like an obvious thing but it's, it's, it is a point worth making that people do from these different businesses and uh, I'd say organizations because ultimately, you know, the remit of, um, of Visit Scotland is also to, to promote Scotland. But it amazes me how little um, communication does take place between these different um, areas. And, you know, uh, a guy we had over for Wide Days a few years ago, a young, um, a young hotelier, he worked for a hotel chain and he convinced his boss to let him target a new hotel to the music sector. And it was pretty straightforward. He went around and spoke to different promoters in the city, uh, you know, from small gig promoters right up to festival promoters and suggested they might like to use his hotel in the you know, they fixed it up so that it had its own radio station. It sold vinyl from a local record shop. They they allowed a 4 p.m. checkout on a Sunday. So, you know, um, the kind of things that would appeal to someone being at a festival or that was making a, a musical weekend of it for themselves. And um, the staff were actually hired not for their experience of... Um, of um, working in hotels, but for their local knowledge of the music scene and places to eat. And it was a real success. I mean, they rolled it out in other, in other Scandinavian cities after it proved to work in Oslo. But the, the point was is that when he spoke to the promoters, they all said, all oh, right, you're the first hotel that's ever approached us. And um, it seems, I think what'd be interesting is to look at ways where maybe there there can be a, a central point or something that does bring that together. I mean, we, we did discuss the idea of having just a, a music guide to, to Edinburgh, but are there any other things that you could think of from from well, your perspective? Well, well, there's a, there's a food and drink guide to Edinburgh. It comes out every year. Um, is 
Uh, there's also there's the list produce a food and drink guide, which you can purchase. There's lots of these whiskey brochures, there's golf brochures, there's fishing brochures. You know, there's there's no shortage of other other parts of um, of, of Scottish tourism and Scottish culture have plenty of material that you can give to someone who asks about it. But music, there's, there's not a lot. Yeah, and that does mystify me because it seems like Tourism Intelligence Scotland have a, a brochure or a, a guide for businesses wanting to appeal to pretty much every segment or niche in the tourism sector other than music. Do you know why that, that no. is? No, okay. it's always... There, there doesn't seem to be very much on music actually on the Visit Scotland website. It is, I mean, I guess the one of the reasons that, um, and we're not attacking you here, by the way, I, I'm just, it's not like, uh, let's have a go at the Visit Scotland guy, but I raise it just because um, it does interest me. It seems that, you know, for a, a tourism niche that's worth over a hundred million pounds, um, maybe it's uh, up to John with a hydro to take out a colossal advert and um, sponsor Born to be White to do a, a music guide but, to Scotland that we can hand out to tourists, yeah, but, and but, spread the love. But, I have, but, but it, does, it does come both ways. That, that's a very fair, fair point you've made. But the same token, because you can't give a, a yearly brochure on music, so you have to have up-to-date, you know, weekly, what's happening, what's, what's the next gig's playing, who's playing where, you have to have that material coming through as well, as well as the, the top down stuff. Yeah. But you have to have the bottom organic up stuff. And that the gig guide is, is great. But if you're a visitor who doesn't really know even what they want to listen to, and you've got to look through the gig guide to try and figure out what you're gonna, where you're going to go tonight, it's perhaps, it's, it's a bit daunting. I know Faith Little from Festival Edinburgh is in the audience, and I, I let you off being on the panel, but um, I did warn you that I might ask you a question. Are there um, are any of the festivals that are part of your organization, do any of them work closely with tourism businesses to, to combine? Um... Part of the reason that we are here, that there is a guide, is because we work together and we lobby we make sure and we have fights about it and we have had to have fight fights about it get make our place in the tourism agenda so you've got to do that but i'm just going you know it can't be with, with with this with music with lots of things it's got to be online there's got to be a website and just thinking about glasgow as well i mean basically what they call in the tourism industry the hydro it's an attack brand for music in the city you know it's what's going out into the world and making a name for it but what what we use is different festivals as attack brands in different markets, which means that with something like the Hydro, you can use it on a major site, whether it's a UNESCO City of Music branded site. From a marketing point of view, it's just about Glasgow as a great music city, or however we choose to do it in Edinburgh as well, and we can come to that in a minute. But if you've got that, that, that big kind of brand, the big Hydro brand out there drawing people's eyes, you can then cross sell into all the other things that are going on in the city and people can start to move around and make their journeys. And what we need here in Edinburgh as well is a way of doing that and saying, this is what's happening in the city, this is the music that's going on, and then allow people to make their own journeys, but also then be able to sell into the record shops and, and just promote it effectively. We've, you've got to find a way of doing that yourselves and you've got to raise the money and you've got to have conversations with Visit Scotland to support that. But also Visit Scotland and the Scottish government have these celebratory years, and they're like, this is the year of food and drink. But actually, let's talk about having a, a year of music. And in that year, we invest in some of the infrastructure and some of the marketing, and actually even some of the product that we need to, to build up um, awareness, uh, new ways of marketing this, and new ways of collaborating and working together, because it's collaborating and working together that will change this. Well, if we're talking, say, about take something like the book festival or the art festival, are there things that um, allow them to to go around the world and um, be used to sell Edinburgh as a destination through the actual yeah. events? And are there any initiatives that you're aware of which where they do this year round? Yeah, yeah. So there's two two on that international side. We market through our website very aggressively, and then a. Uh, what they do, and it's, it's about what you all do as well, what they do is they look at the partners and networks around the world that they can move 
artists around on. So they're promoting through artists. So the book festival's got an alliance of book festivals and they move artists around those book festivals and they use them being there to promote the fact that the book festival's happening and that there's a great literary scene here. And the same happens with other festivals as well. A lot of it's done through, through international networks. And when the artists are out there, we use it to get the message about that festival or we use um, our presence more generally to get the message out about Edinburgh as a festival city. I think that's an interesting point because Hamburg does that um, where they, if the city is represented at a trade show or some kind of international event, they'll bring along a couple of their their local acts and have them have them playing, and that could be anything from you know hip hop act right through to some kind of classical performer. But they place music at the heart of all their international marketing activity, and also in terms of um, you know inviting. Um, inviting people to set up business in their city so they you know someone comes to hamburg they get the music tour of the city and it's very much used as part of the the selling point so i guess that's something to uh to think about both in in edinburgh and in um in glasgow and indeed in shetland where you hail from john the shetlanders have been very good at this um so big up shetland um now has anyone got a question um from the audience we've got a a microphone wandering around yeah there's someone just in here i see a hand and not much more olaf can i just ask you when when you're taking people around on tours do all of them ask about music lots of people do and interestingly enough quite often it's just they want to just hear live music because there's so many places where you can't hear live music so they'll be as happy to go and see a covers band and whistle binkies as they would be to see a serious trad session or you know a serious jazz or funk band in the jazz bar or you know one uh, pair of guys there asked me where um, they could check out a decent dubstep DJ and already had Sneaky Pete circled on their map. So I just had to tell them where it was in relation to their, uh, to their hotel. So, yeah, I mean, you, there is a, there is an interest and it's not necessarily the primary reason for their visit, but while they're here, they want that as, as part of their overall experience. Uh, I was going to ask, um, during, well, if we're going to talk about tourism, the biggest thing in Edinburgh is obviously the, the big festival. The, the fringe and um, it seems like every venue in town is taken up with everything except for music so what do you think that we can be doing to promote music during that time i think it's a, i would have agreed with you on this point if up until a few years ago but i think that despite the loss of what was called tea on the fringe um which was briefly rebranded as the edge without a cooking lager sponsor um that vacuum was filled quite quickly um, by grassroots promoters. And it is difficult because um, for a long time, traditional music venue, music venues that, let's say, program music um, all year round would sell out to the highest bidder for, you know, fringe activity, which is usually comedians or theater. But um, certainly the Electric Circus has very much stuck to a music program. So is Sneaky Pete's. So, you know, two of the key uh, year-round venues are doing music. And then um, the Chapel Rig Church has been used for for events. And um, the Made in Scotland initiative was um, was expanded to take in, um, take in music as well. So I think it can be a bit more difficult if certain venues like the voodoo rooms are taken out of circulation but for the i would say for the grassroots music community it doesn't seem to affect us as badly um in recent years or hasn't affected us as badly in recent years as it did do in the in the past are, are you looking to do something during the um the fringe just like a gig to be honest would be nice um i guess the right. question michael where are you <laughs> If he likes you, then you you've got you've got in early enough. There's a good chance, and we we launched what was called the Born to Be Wide Edinburgh Night at the start of every August, where we get ten acts that are performing during the um, during the fringe to play ten minute sets. So it's pretty much what Gilded Balloon or Assembly do, where they give you a, 
a snapshot right at the beginning of all the acts, except we're not doing it for, you know, one venue. It's pretty much a way of promoting all the um, all the local music initiatives. Another one is actually in Henry's, uh, which is Matthew from Song by Toad. So if he does that again this year, that's, a, that's another one on the list. 